right. Hi, everybody. My name is Danielle. I'm the founder of Tackle It's Next and a founding member of the Making Sports More Equitable Coalition. We're continuing our initiative to create conversations about equity and inclusion in sports. And we're talking today about education and programming in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, or DEI for short, and really how it plays a role in making sports, the sports industry more equitable. And we're really going to explore what DEI programming and conversations in the space look like in the sports organizations across the industry. We'll discuss new opportunities within teams and leagues, initiatives that have been created through this kind of, of programming, and how to really keep the momentum going. And we really hope to highlight the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations, education programming, and really demonstrate how these ideas help create a level playing field. And we really wanna focus also on how each of us within our own roles in sports can keep the momentum going through some of these conversations. So today we are here with Zoe Enriquez, the VP of Strategic Alliances and Development and Jarrell Price, the Senior Director of Partnerships at RISE. So I wanna thank both of you guys for being here with us today and having this conversation. We are so excited. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, we're thrilled. Absolutely. Well, I think first things first, I gave you guys titles, but can you tell us both about RISE, what's the mission of the organization, and talk to us maybe about each of your individual roles. So maybe I'll throw it to Zoe, uh, and then Jarrell, you can, you can tell us a little bit about your work as well. Perfect. So at a very high level, RISE is a national nonprofit that is dedicated to educating and empowering the sports community to eliminate racism and champion social justice. So we do that through a number of ways, but really that education piece and the empowerment piece are two big ways of doing that. And we can obviously go into more details later in the conversation. But from my standpoint, my role is to pull in strategic alliances from a corporate level, a foundational level, and an individual donor level to make sure that we have the ability to fund and support the work that we're doing as an organization. And then high level from my end is um, we work with our partners. Um, our partners range from youth all the way to professional. Um, we work with ages from really around age 11 all the way to executive level. Um, we provide programming with them. Um, so we work with youth organizations, uh, community organizations. We work with college athletic departments, uh, college conferences. We work with professional leagues and teams to really provide them the educational tools to talk about DEI and have those tough conversations around social justice. Um, so our, our team really works with the really those grassroots partners um, and really those state organizations, local organizations, those teams and leagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that there's so many different, I don't want to say levels, but just different groups of people you're working with really across all so many different levels. I think that's really awesome. And I guess it, at kind of a high level, maybe you guys can talk about this, but really how do you guys work to, to bring education and programming around sometimes controversial, I guess, to put it bluntly, topics? And how did you guys find, and, and, and maybe it was teams before you that have found these best practices? Like, how do you go from talking to youth all the way to talking to executives, like, is there a best practice that you're like, here's our starting point, and then we kind of fiddle from there, like, talk us through, um, I don't know if Jarrell, that's you, or Zoe, more question for you, but talk us through how that works. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to take on that question. I, to be honest, it really varies, right? When you look at DEI and social justice, every organization, whether that be youth, all the way to professional, including colleges, they're all in a different space when it comes to these topics, right? Depending on, you know, are they a school in an urban area? Are they in a school in a rural area? What does that look like? What are their goals and initiatives that they've already taken to have these tough conversations? And it's really tied around our RISE curriculum. Our RISE curriculum is built in six major buckets. And that first bucket is around identity and it's tied to a skill of reflection, right? How do you talk about oneself to understand yourself and your identity and you have conversations with other people amongst themselves and their identity, right? And the goal there is to really find those commonalities between all of us and what do we really want to be known for? And we define this in our workshop is deep identity and surface identity. That surface identity is what we see, but we all want to be known for that deep identity, right? Like what are those commonalities that we may have? You know, I have a dog. Do you have a dog, Danielle? Like that's something that we can relate to, which can help start having different and difficult conversations, but it's really guided around our curriculum and how we build and grow through there. So again, we start with oneself and then we build to like a community on how do we bring folks together and build that community in that type of leadership within their areas. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think that curriculum piece is so strong. We really have started from our chief programs officer who creates the curriculum and has been with RISE since its inception, really uses some of those best practices from earlier work in the educational space to make sure that we are aligning those six topics, as Gerald mentioned earlier, to those skills that are going to take people further. I think at the base of what we do as an organization it's really about creating the safe space for the hard conversations to take place. Mm -hmm. So while we do have that curriculum, we're not standing in a classroom educating from a, from a standpoint of you might see in the other educational experiences. What we're doing is creating that space so that people get comfortable or getting their own identity, figuring out what's important to them, but then they're able to have the harder conversations with their peers, whether that's teammate to teammate in the sports space or whether we're working with front office staff and it's a larger, you know, more organizational area that they need to explore. Yeah, yeah. and did you too, the great thing about it is RISE programming, it's all interactive. So as Zoe and I are having this conversation with you today, that's not how our programming is created. Like Danielle, you are actively going through a workshop and you're participating in a fun activity to allow you to have these conversations, right? And that's what makes that space safe. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like it's not really like a workshop where somebody's standing up at the front being like, okay, turn to page four in your workbook and like <laughs> fill out these questions. It's more like, all right, let's break the ice. Let's have this activity. Let's have a conversation as a group and be able to kind of find these commonalities. And I think that identity piece that you both mentioned is so important because it is about common ground and where you can find out like where you intersect with other people mm -hmm. versus like kind of showing the differences or like where things, you know, aren't necessarily the same. Um, and I guess, you know, in terms of, of conversation, that seems like the word that keeps coming up here. You know, how do you guys see these conversations typically going with some of the, the work and the organizations you're working with? Like, do you find that like this first conversation, you're like, well, we know it's the first time. So it's going to be kind of more like, well, we'll see how it goes. And then we need to keep going. And, you know, how do you guys see these unfolding with these different organizations? I'm sure it's individualistic, but, you know, in general, you know, how do you guys see the progress kind of going as you as you have more of these activities and conversations? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start and I'll let Jarell add in, but really from, a, um, from the get-go when we're working with a new organization, we will start with a climate survey because we do, to your point, every organization has a different starting place. Some organizations, what we, what we love in our work is seeing the same organizations come back year after year, season after season, and continue the growth with us. But whenever we're working with a new organization, that climate survey really gives us the opportunity to dive into where they stand, what their culture is in their space. And so by starting there, we can custom create the curriculum and the process and even how many sessions we do. In the youth space, we tend to work with multi-week sessions where it's usually eight to 10 weeks, an hour a week over the course of that time period. Whereas in other cases, we might do three or four workshops within a one week period or spread them out throughout the year. Yeah, and Zoe hit that all on the nail on the head on that. And like, that's where our programming typically starts. But you know, I'll add too, it, when you see young people having these conversations, it's so empowering, especially youth, right? Like they want to have these conversations. They always ask why. And then when we get to the college, like, well, what can I actively do now? What's that action piece? And as we get older and like we talk to professional leagues or corporate sponsors, they want to have these conversations too. But it's almost we got to help guide them into those conversations versus like college and the youth are like, okay, I'm 100% in, let's do it and let's just right. have you know, so, but it's, it's really good to see, like, those are the differences, but also those are commonalities that we're seeing amongst various age groups that, you know, folks want to have these conversations, but how do you have it? Um, and helping folks understand there's no wrong answer. Like, we're going to all mess up. We're all going to say the wrong thing sometimes, but how do we understand one of each one another and be able to just have an open dialogue? Yeah, I think that's such a great point is that I think people expect that these conversations, like if you make a mistake, like a buzzer is going to go off and someone's going to be like, oh, you blew it. Like, you know, it, that's not really the goal. It's really to make those mistakes and be able to show people like, hey, like, let's talk about what just happened here. You know, I think there's this fear of, you know, making that mistake. Um, and so I'm glad that you said, like, we know that that's going to happen and we don't want people to like not engage in these conversations because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Um, right but really more just being open to having that conversation. I can see, especially working with professionals in a work environment, they might be hesitant to speak in certain ways that might get them, they think, in trouble. So that safe space you guys have both mentioned, I think is so important. Um, yeah, I, if I could just quickly. Yeah, please, guys, I do, we do 
a lot. One of the very important things to us that we do when we work with a corporate sponsor is to make sure that they also go through our programming. We want to make sure that they understand not only what we do at the youth level or at the collegiate or professional level, but what, the, what we can do and bring into an organization that's also supporting the sports world. And I, I've actually been very surprised at how, after the first session, how open and honest people are. I think there is some hesitancy going into that first session, but it, again, the way that our curriculum is made up to be interactive, it really facilitates the conversation. And you see people really starting to open up and say, what is on their mind, see, say how they've felt or how they have perceived things. We do a lot of work around perception and, and also privilege and power as part of our curriculum. And I know from my standpoint, being at RISE now two years, the growth that I've just had from my own experience has been exponential. And I get to see other people going through that program after program, which is really exciting. Yeah. And Daniel, what I was going to add too is that curriculum that we're talking about, those six buckets, those six buckets are the same no matter from youth all the way up to professional, right? But within those buckets, we have various activities that you can grow on based on the conversations that we continue to have. The other piece too that I'll add that we that we make sure we do is that we don't record any of our sessions, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you create another opportunity for the room to feel safe yeah. and to have these open dialogues. Um, and to that curriculum piece, one of the buckets is around diversity concepts and defining different words that go into DEI. So equity versus equality, what are those, what are the differences and how are those defined as, right? What's the difference between race, racism and anti-racism? What are these terms that we're throwing around and having conversations about, but not really understanding what and how it's defined as? So again, we're providing folks the opportunity to learn and engage and have these conversations around different terms that are being used in our in society. Hmm. No, I think that's so important. And, and you guys touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear around whether it's corporate organizations that you're working with, Zoe, and kind of the strategic alliances, like how do you decide or figure out or prospect, like who are the right partners for you all in terms of those strategic alliances? And I, I love that you're also having them go through your programming so they know exactly what they're partnering with and like the, the benefits of it, right? But you know, also are there goals for you all? Like, you know, we want partners that do these things and can help us in these ways. Can you talk us through a little bit of what that process is like for you all? Absolutely. So when I referred to our mission earlier in the conversation, it, you may have picked out the sports community. And so when we look for those strategic alliances, when we look for corporations, we are looking for those organizations that are truly a part of the sports community, whether they're sponsoring a league or a team, whether they're invested in local sports in their own communities, whatever that looks like, we wanna make sure that we always tie that back to the heart of our mission, which is the athletes, the coaches, the front office staff, that whole sports community, including fans. And you know, from our standpoint, it's a pretty wide opportunity. I would, you know, when, when we look at who our top corporate partners are, whether it's a Pepsi and Anheuser-Busch and Under Armour, Reebok, all of those incredible partners that we're already working with are all invested in the sports community in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, no, I think that's really great. And I think that's kind of a question that I wanted to ask you guys later, but I think it makes sense to ask now, like, why sports? Like, why is this existing only in the sports landscape? And I don't know if Jarrell or Zoe, either of you have a have an answer that comes right to the top of your mind, but like, it's, I think it's very interesting. And I, I think it's, it's very important that you guys have chosen to use sport as that catalyst for all this education and all of this programming. And specifically, you know, you guys are working with sports leagues and sports teams and even like college sports teams, right? Athletes, like young people that play sports, the fans. So like, why is sports this kind of industry or like unifying tie that you guys really want to focus on as an organization? Yeah, I would say to answer that question, really, we've seen throughout history that sports has always been a convener, no matter what the topic is or what the issue at hand is about or the conversations that need to be had, we're able to use sport as a way to bring folks together and have it. And I remember being a kid and just going out there playing sports, it didn't matter what someone looked like or who they were when I'm like, oh, the goal is to win, right? And how do you how do you piece that goal to win? You know, you come together and and I think that's how we at Rise are so successful. So we use sport as a way to bring folks together and allow them to have that conversation in a way they probably would not have had the conversation. Hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, that is the reason we work through sports. That's pulling everyone together, as Cheryl said. I think and where that extends into the communities where we've seen a lot of mm -hmm. support there is you look at athletes and they're oftentimes leaders in their own community. Um, you look at, you know, 
Colin Kaepernick, you look at, you know, Roberto Clemente, Simone, Simone Biles, all of them have had a place where they've been able to be leaders, not just in their sport, but in the wider community in general. And so if we can change the behaviors and the perceptions and change the attitudes of the athletes in the room, they can then bring that wider. I think we have a great example, but I'm not going to go into very large detail here, but we have a relationship with the Denver Broncos and the Boys and Girls Club in Denver, Colorado. And you really see some of their athletes going into the club, working with the youth, and it's expanded even outside of what we do at RISE. We went through the programming with them, but now we've really seen them able to take off and they're doing community-wide projects together in this space, but starting with that athletic community to begin mm -hmm. with. Yeah, no, it's so important. I think sport is that kind of universal language that everyone can kind of get behind. And I love that you said, Gerald, that it's a it's a connector, like everybody's coming together for something. And, you know, when you go to a sports game, it's not like all sports fans come from the same part of the city, right? Everybody's coming in from their different backgrounds or different, you know, areas of the country, whatever it is to come support their team. And so I think using that as that kind of question that you asked earlier, like, do you have a dog? Do you, I have a dog? You know, it's like, are you a fan of this team? So am I, like we have that in common. We can be sad or be happy together about the result, right? Yeah. So I think that's such a great way to bring people together. And you're so right, Zoe, with the athletes that also have such great platforms and have this ability to reach people, especially young people, um, to kind of have these conversations and really change the narrative. I think that's been something throughout history we've seen, but especially in today's day and age with social media, I think it's even more apparent. Um, and that kind of leads me to my next question is obviously the last three years, we've been having a lot more of these conversations I would say more openly, I would say we've, we've been seeing more people open to having these conversations, actively seeking out these conversations. So in terms of the work you all are doing, have you seen your processes shift from like really going after organizations, going out to community organizations, going out to sponsors or corporate, corporate partners, vice versa, people coming to you and saying, hey, Zoe, Gerald, like we want people to come to us, like come to our organization, like partner us with the team. Like, can you talk to me a little bit about if there was a switch or kind of how you guys are dealing with all of these probably requests in my mind, I could see you guys being, having a lot of people that are like, we want to do this programming too. How do you guys manage that? And how do you say, okay, here's who we're working with. Here's who we're not, you know, are, are there limits to some of the things that you do? So I, I feel like my answer will be the shorter one. So I'll, I'll go real fast and kick it over to Jarrell. But from a personal standpoint, I was brought into Rise and I started the week after George Floyd's murder. So it was a very busy time in the country. It was a very hard time in the country, but at Rise, it was really things were picking up. Um, and so we did have a lot of people reaching out to us to grow our work. Um, I think that there was a shift from Rise doing a lot of external outreach to people coming to us and seeing us as a leader in the space. I think from a standpoint of our ability to grow, it was an unfortunate convergence, but that convergence of the social justice platforms happening in the United States combined with COVID, it allowed us to switch to a more digital platform. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to do more work with partners throughout the country in a faster time period because of that. We had to move pretty quickly to switch things over, but the team on the program side was absolutely incredible and really hit the ground running to be able to make the transition and work with a lot more people. Yeah, and I agree with Zoe, and my experience has been the same as Zoe. I started probably about a few months after Zoe in August 2020, um, and basically what Zoe's saying is, has, has been my experience here at RISE too. And we're seeing a lot of partners come to us and not only come to us for the education, but also come to us to change their sport, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're working with a great partner called SailGP. They're like this global sailing organization and they're made up of right now 10 teams and they're, those 10 teams are national teams across the, across the globe. Um, and they've come to us asking for our help to how do you diversify the sport of sailing, right? Which is a predominantly white sport and you have to have some type of access to a boat and water to right. participate in, right? So they've come to us asking for help and they've identified an initiative called a Foiling First um, Learning how to foil camp right and it's really to bring various organizations at the youth level that may not have access to water or sport or 
about and diversify the sport and show them that boiling can be made for everybody, right? So we do these camps with them and we invite folks from underserved, uh, underserved communities to participate in sailing, to show them that there's a sport and there's access to it. But also you don't have to be interested in sailing because part of sail GP is also the technology piece of it, right? They have mm -hmm. a huge partnership with Oracle and they use technology to grow their sport. How fast can this boat go? What's the data we receive? So how do you tie that back to STEM, right? Sport again is a convener, but not everybody knows how to play a sport or wants to play in a sport, but they might be interested in science or technology or math or whatever that topic may be or interest level maybe. So we do a lot of great things with partners on one, understanding their goals and initiatives that they have on educating but also empowering. And that's where SailGP is really, really doing a good job on empowering themselves to go on the community and identify ways to support and diversify their sport. Oh, that's such a great example. And I love that it's someone coming to you with a specific goal and saying, how can we do this? But also really being able to communicate some of the things that, you know, again, I wouldn't have thought of technology and sailing going hand in hand, but like being able to think about that, like, of course that makes sense. And, you know, I think that's another great way to bring people in. And I think it's, it's awesome to see that organizations are really actively thinking about this, prioritizing this and saying, we need help. We want to go to those experts, which you guys clearly are, um, who have done this before and can help us get where we want to go. Um, and that kind of ties me to my, ne my next question, which is, you know, Darrell, you talked about Sale GP coming to you wants to do this kind of growth, this diversification of their sport, and that probably is going to come through doing these community-oriented kind of community organization work. How do you guys really find the right partners, the right community organizations? You know, how do you know the right places to go to help a, a client like a Sale GP? Um, how do you get connected with these organizations, and how do you start those relationships if you don't already have one with, with that community or with that organization? I would say it varies. We do have an opportunity on our website for folks to request working with RISE or share, share their interest in working with RISE. And based okay. on the conversation, we schedule meetings and want to understand their mission and what they want out of this and how our mission aligns with theirs. Um, but we do have like a lot of college partners and a lot of professional partners that we work with because they want to have this work. But then they also introduce us to local community partners that they may have partnerships with mm -hmm. to do the work alongside them, right? So we've really built our partnerships based on existing relationships that we've created through our work that we're doing. Um, and I really say that from like the, especially at the uh, professional level, right? No matter the professional team that we work with, we really lean on them to identify a youth partner to go through an eight to 10 week program like Zoe mentioned, right? Um, as a nonprofit, we do not have a fee for service model, right? But we do have operational budgets where we work with the partner, identify, hey, can you provide a contribution to RISE to offset us doing work within your community? Mm -hmm. So we're able to have these conversations and add different funding ties to it um, and also share the story on how this professional sports partner identified this youth organization and this is what we we're able to do together and drive impact. Um, and I know Zoe talked about this earlier, but we do surveys, but we also collect data from our surveys after each of our workshops. Um, and we gather pre-surveys and post-surveys so we can see the change in mindsets with folks. Um, but we are very data-driven. We share this data with our partners that we have just so they can see the impact that we're doing together and how to continue to drive that change. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And that actually answers another question. And I'm sure you guys could both elaborate a little bit more. So I'll still ask it. But, you know, I think the surveys you talked about in terms of measuring success, that was something else I was really curious about is with all these different programs, I'm sure there's individual goals, metrics, things you're looking at for each one. But, you know, kind of do you have similar metrics from your end that you're like, like Zoe, you mentioned earlier with like a corporate partner, like a repeat customer kind of coming back in and saying, we want more workshops, we want more programming, right? Or we want more resources. Like, how do you guys measure within your roles? I guess, please tell me based on your own experience and, and the, the clients you're working with, but how do you track those success measures and what measures are you looking for in general in terms of, was this a successful project or is there something we can change as we continue to work with them? Um, maybe Zoe, we'll start with you and then we'll go to drought. Sure. So Rise is very interested in measuring our data. <laughs> we had something that we not only have always done, but we've really doubled down in the last year and a half, I'd say. 
um, making sure that we are not only measuring in those pre and post surveys, like Gerald mentioned, we want to make sure that we're understanding what is the mindset of a participant coming into the program. We ask a series of questions. We ask those same series of questions after the program has ended so that we can see how has the perception shifted? How have attitudes changed? What other things are you planning on doing as you come out of this? We don't want this to be the end of your learning and leadership opportunities. Are you going to pursue this? Are you going to take the time to learn more? Do you want to come back into more RISE programming? So that we're using it not only to see how our people are reacting to our programming, but also using it as an opportunity to then report back and, and conglomerate all the information so that we can break things out. We can see, you know, in a particular area of the country, are we are we making changes here? Um, we can break it down from demographic standpoint so that we can kind of see, you know, are, are women experiencing this differently than men are? How are we looking at that? And so when we work with some of our corporate partners or our league partners, like a NASCAR, for example, we will take all that information, we will analyze the data, and we'll share that back out. But then we can also shift how we're analyzing it to meet their needs, depending on what they're looking for, what they want to get out of it. So that as we go into the next round of programming, we can also use that to inform how we move forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Danielle, one thing I'll touch on too, is from our college standpoint, this is this one's very cool, because we do this a lot with our college partners is we do what we call our discovery phase. And this is where we really get a feel of what is it like on campus at your institution, right? Mm -hmm. And that discovery phase is really made up of five parts. Parts one and two is a climate survey, as Zoe mentioned, one survey for student athletes and one survey for coaches, administrators, and staff. Okay, that survey goes out. Then about two weeks after that survey goes out, we do two focus groups, one with student athletes and one with coaches, administrators, and staff. We always do the student athlete first because there's questions in there that in that in that focus group that we may ask. Well, Danielle, if you are the AD at X institution, well, how would you go about fixing these types of issues? Then it pits, oh wait, I'm actually the decision maker and I actually got to think about this. And we gather that information. Then when we go into the coaches, administrators and staff session, we're able to provide them, well, this is what your students athletes are saying, or here's their perception on how, how it is on campus. After those four steps, we gather that information um, and then we take it back to the institution saying, here's the data we've collected from all your student athletes and all your coaches, administrators and staff. And here are our recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and as Zoe mentioned, we are very, very collaborative with our partners. We share the data, but at the end of the day, they are the ones that have to drive the change. So we may say, here's our recommendation. How would you like to move forward? Whether that be, okay, we wanna do a train the trainer model that we do with our partners. Okay, we wanna train our SAC student athletes, or we wanna train X student athletes or X coaches to now lead these conversations in their locker rooms or with their teammates. Right. So again, we educate, but also a key point to our mission is that empowerment piece. And how do we tap into that and allow folks to have these conversations? But again, we gather that data, we share with the partner and then ask, how do you want to move forward? But the cool point of it is we always ask that athletic department, we need you to include your DEI person on campus because we oftentimes see, there's a, see that there's a disconnect between the athletic department and the DEI office on campus and not really understanding the resources. So once we bring the DEI person in and they're like, okay, here's what the athletic department is doing, but we, won't, we don't want them doing something separate than what you all are doing and your goals and initiatives on campus are. So how do we make this again, a convener for all of us to meet and see how do we continue to drive change on our campus? Mm, no, I, I love that. I think one, going kind of summarizing everything you guys are saying. One, the power of data is so important. So I'm so glad that this is a huge priority for you all, especially in the work that you're doing. It can be really hard to track metrics in similar yeah. ways because of the variety of people you're working with. But I think it is really great that you're almost democratizing that data, giving it back to them and saying like, here you go, here's the data. And I love the question you said, Gerald, what would you like to do? Well, how would you like to move forward? You're not saying you must do this or you're wrong or you're, you know, you're kind of saying, here's what we recommend on our expert opinion, but like, how do you want to use this? And I think linking in that DEI office on campus is so important because the athletic department can sometimes feel like its own world separated from campus, not even just on the DEI side, on the career development, like, you know, career career uh, um, center, all of those things can kind of feel separate, especially for the student athletes who feel like, like, this is where I go every day. This is where the resources need to be. Um, and so I love that you're bringing them into the fold from kind of the university-wide standpoint saying, hey, 
we do all these programmings already, or we have these resources on campus already. How do we engage and intertwine that? So I think that's so awesome. And I'm glad to hear um, that that discovery process really does include a lot of people besides just that, you know, person reaching out saying, hey, we want our team to go through this. So thank you guys for walking us through that. That's super, super awesome. Um, another couple questions as we're wrapping up this interview. And I think we talked a little bit about some of the empowerment and you talked about this too, Jarrell, but I think I wanna hear more along the lines of that general response, right? How do people that work with you all, whether it's corporate partners or strategic partners on your end, Zoe, or, or Jarrell, the teams, the youth, the, the kind of community organizations that you guys link up with through organizations that you're, you're partnering with, what has been that general response? Have you seen and are, have you been able to see over the years that you guys have been there since 2020, this act, this moving target? You know, have you seen change? Have you gotten the feedback that this is working? Or, you know, have you seen this kind of general positive response? And can you share any kind of success stories from, from each of your work um, that would kind of ring true for, for, for that vision over the past two years of the work you guys have been doing? Yeah, we see we see with our partners all the time. They're always like, "We want more, we want more." I'm like, "Okay, we gotta actually plan this. <laughs> we gotta take some time and think through it." Like, our partners have grown tremendously over the last few years, and we let's see, we've done over like 500 programs just last year alone, right? But before that, we're in what the hundreds of 200s, and now we're over to like three, four, five hundred workshops in a calendar year. Um, but again, I think our big piece is not only that education piece, but that empowerment piece. Um, and oftentimes we, we do empowerment in various ways. Like one program we have is our Rise to Vote program, where we work with student athletes, we work with coaches, we work with professional athletes on getting them registered to vote, right? What are your, what are your voting initiatives? Now, whichever way you vote, that's probably fine, but you should be able to use that power of a vote to make whatever decision you do based on the research you find. And we're seeing that across all our partnerships is not only that edu educational piece, but that rise to action piece. Mm -hmm. What are steps that you can take in your community, whether that being involved, like one of our um, athletes in, for the Broncos does, or you no, know, when we're looking at partners like Under Armour in the NBA, and we're working on our building bridges through basketball program. You no, know, these are programs that we want to include youth and law enforcement and bringing them into conversations. Again, that's another component on rising to action and bringing voices together to have tough conversations. So as we look at our partnerships, we always start with the education piece, but we we look to find ways to have different conversations from an actionable standpoint. So I would say that is like a really, really cool component of our program is seeing that action piece play out and seeing that change in the community that we're working in. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, and it's something I think too, to go off that with the action piece, we see with our Super Bowl programming every year, for example, in addition to going through the multiple sessions of programming over the course of, you know, a couple months leading up to Super Bowl, that group of kids, and we're expanding this into other areas as well when we work with youth, do a project and they get to present their project and they get to talk about it as to how would they take what they've learned during the RISE programming back out into their community, serve as a community leader, and be able to enact change in their own communities. And that's a really cool part because as Jarrell mentioned earlier, when you're working with these young people, they, they want change. They're hungry for it. They want to enact it right now. They don't even want to wait. They want it now. <laughs> And so how do you take that? I think one of the most impactful things that I've heard our CEO, Diane Bones Burford say before is, is it a moment or is it a movement? Yep. And when we talk about the work being done in the DEI space, obviously we want it to be a movement. And the difference between a moment and a movement is that forward momentum as what's that next step. And we're, we're trying to incorporate a lot of that into our programming. Yeah, no, a moment or a movement. That is that is awesome. I love that. And I think that's a really great way to kind of look at some of the things that organizations are doing. You know, is this something we're just focusing on because it's here? Uh, or do we really want to make some actionable change? So I love that. And I love the action piece that you mentioned, Joel. I think that's a huge step of success if you can see it going from like conversation into action, um, really showing that it, it is important and it's being prioritized and actions being taken. Um, I just have two more questions and I would love to hear from both of you on this. I think this whole interview has been answers to this question in some way, shape or form, but how do each of you feel that RISE is contributing to make the sports industry more equitable? And maybe just kind of a summary kind of in your, your kind of number one reason why you think, how you think RISE is making sports more equitable. Um, if anyone has one, I'll go to you first, but otherwise feel free to chime in. I'd love to hear from both of you on this. I would say for me, it's us 
helping folks to find terms, right? That's where it all starts is like folks don't, not understanding where these terms come from or who, who created this term or why we use X term. So I think by starting there, that's been like really cool to see and how we're really educating folks to understand the difference and really think through it. Like when you're in a situation, oh wait, I learned about this. Got it, I can answer it. Cool, like yeah. that's like the most immediate one that I can think of, but that would be my answer. I love that. Yeah, I, I know I personally related really well to some of our bias curriculums. I think the biggest change we can make is when people start identifying their own biases, when they start that self-reflection piece. And, and by understanding themselves more, they can make the changes. You can't change what you don't see, right? So I think where I've really experienced it myself and seen other people experience it is realizing something they may not have seen in themselves before. And, and by realizing it, acknowledging it, internalizing it, they can say, okay, this is a, this is a place I can make change every day. Mm, yeah. Two really, really good answers. I love that. And so your, your answer kind of leads me into our last question, which is when we try to ask throughout all of these conversations, but I think we mentioned this earlier around making mistakes. And I think we have so many people when they're thinking about conversations around equity and diversity and inclusion, that they're just terrified because they don't want to misstep or make a mistake or say the wrong thing. Um, and then that taking action piece, right? Nobody wants to be seen as like performative or just doing it because it's that moment versus, you know, you know, actually making meaningful change. So I want to ask on behalf of kind of young people coming into the sports industry, maybe athletes that have a platform, you know, how do all of us in our various roles in this big sports industry like actively keep that momentum going without towing that line of kind of performative or doing it because it's now cool to be activism, you know, an activist, that kind of a thing. And I'd love to just hear your two opinions on this um, as we close out here. I think it's advice for people that may want to do something, but don't necessarily know where to start. I'll, I'll dive in first. And Danielle, I think you hit on it. You know, I think it is, how do you jump in and, and how can you be authentic with it? And I think the place that I come from as a white woman is acknowledging that I need to be vulnerable. I'm going to make mistakes. I, I hope that in my conversations that people lead with grace, that they understand that mistakes I might make are from an uneducated standpoint and not from a biased standpoint, that I'd like them to help correct me and, and bring that. But it, I also have to do the work as a white woman. I need to be able to put in the work, do my research, not lean necessarily on others to inform me, but really investigate and self-reflect and start making changes and, and then start educating others around me. Um, and it's hard and you need to be vulnerable. And I will say in my two years that I've been here at Rise, I think I've made some growth, but there's obviously always more to go and, and a lot more education to be had. Mm. That's a great answer, Zoe. And for mine, I would say understanding how you want to be involved in this space and this work that you're doing in sport, right? And I say that because there's many ways to do that, whether it is using your voice on your social media or maybe just fundraising on behalf of a, of a social justice cause. There's just so many outlets that you, that you have out there, whether it's talking to a senator or scheduling those meetings or handing pamphlets out or whatever it may be. There's just so many outlets out there. And my advice to, to someone in this industry and in the sports or wanting to be involved in sports and as a whole is to find where your voice fits for you and following that and taking that journey and see where it leads. Again, you, there's never going to be a right answer, um, but the more stuff you do to educate yourself, it leads you into that empowerment piece, right? You're educating yourself and now you're leading out and going out there and doing that action piece like we talked about, but that would be my advice. Yeah. Wow. Two really good answers. And I think you both hit on the head of this kind of understanding where you fit into this conversation, where you fit in, whether your skills, strengths, et cetera, are, and also being authentic to what matters to you and understanding where you're coming in. Um, I think both really, really great pieces of advice. And I just want to wrap up by thanking both of you for taking so much time to, to chat with us about your work, about RISE, um, and all of the work you guys are doing every day to really work towards equity in sports and really educating teams, leagues, organizations in our industry about the importance of some of these things. Even just the terms that you mentioned, Daryl, is so important, right? Those little things, just they make such a big difference. Um, so thank you for having a conversation with us and giving us a little insight into the work you guys do every day. We really appreciate all of your time.
Now, thank you for having us. And we appreciate you all doing this work to share the work that we do with, with your community. But, and if there's anything that we can do for your listeners, you let us know and we'll try our best to make it happen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Danielle. Yes, I could repeat everything Jarrell just said, but I won't. So thank you. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you these last couple of months since we first met. And thank you for inviting us to be a part of this. Yeah, you guys got it. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be collaborating, I'm sure, again soon and sharing some of the awesome resources you all have along with this interview. So really appreciate it, both your time. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for listening in. Thank you.